Hey everyone, in this video, we're going to do a follow up to our initial video on neural networks. And this video is going to be on backpropagation. Now, I'm making this video on backpropagation mostly because it's a really difficult concept to understand. At least it was for me. I read through multiple blog posts and watched videos, and everyone seems to have their own kind of way of understanding and explaining it. And it was difficult for me to match up all those understandings into what this idea actually means and what it's actually for. So all that said, this is just one video on the internet. So I'm hopefully going to explain backpropagation in a very intuitive way, but I would love any feedback on things that were uh, unclear in the comments below. So first, let's uh, talk about what's the goal of backpropagation. So I would highly encourage watching my intro to neural networks video because we use the exact same example, exact same coefficients and parameters. It's just, we're gonna do a follow up here. So this was the neural network we were looking at in that video. It was a very simple one two features for the input, x1 and x2. Those two features, we take linear combinations of them. We run those through activation function sigma, and we get a hidden layer of two features, h1 and h2. Then we take a linear combination and activation function of those to finally get our predicted probability, p hat. Notice there's a little i here. So this whole thing is implied to take place for one training example. So for example, let's say you have n training examples. Each one has two features. For each one, you would feed it through this neural network and you would get uh, an individual predicted probability for each of these n examples. So that'll become more important in a second. So this is our neural network and we hopefully understood what it's trying to achieve and how it does it. But the biggest burning question of all the questions we have right now is probably how do we calculate all these weights and bias terms, all these w's and b's? If you count them all up, there's nine of them. There's six that happen from this layer to the hidden layer and there's three that happen from the hidden layer to the output. So how do we actually get the correct value for these nine terms? It seems like kind of a daunting task, even though this network is kind of small. So let's kind of just take baby steps towards the goal so that hopefully by the end we understand exactly what we're doing. And even though there looks like a lot of math on the board, we can make sense of all of it. So first here's all the equations that help us understand the same visual we see up here. So just in a nutshell, what's happening Here's the linear combinations going from the input layer to the hidden layer. These are the activation functions which are being run on those uh, linear combinations to get to the hidden layer. Then we take those hidden layers and we do a linear combination of those themselves. So there's some W's and B's here. Then we run a final activation function which we're gonna use sigmoid in this video and we get the predicted probability, pi hat. Okay, so all this math and this picture are the same, so I'll be referencing both of them in this video. So one useful thing that's gonna be helpful doing our calculations is taking the derivative of a sigmoid function. So we've seen this in many previous videos, but just as a recap, if p is equal to the sigmoid function on some argument x, and we're asking for the derivative of that sigmoid with respect to x, it has a pretty nice clean form, which is simply just p times one minus p. So that'll be very important in the calculations we're about to do. Now. We're gonna be using the technique called gradient descent. And so this technique is pretty straightforward. We basically would start by initializing all of these w's and b's to some random values, maybe between zero and one, just some random values. And those random values probably aren't gonna be the correct ones that are gonna give us the best performance in this neural network, but it's a starting point. Then what we do is we ask the very natural question about given some error function, which we're gonna describe in just a moment, we're going to ask about how does small changes in each of these nine w's and b's affect the error function? And we wanna travel in the direction where the error function is being minimized the fastest so that as we take future steps in that direction, so we recompute the gradient, go in that direction, we recompute the gradient again, go in that direction, we're hopefully going to arrive at a point where all these w's and b's are set such that the error function is at a minimum, which means our neural network is in some sense doing good. And so we'll be using that technique of gradient descent. So the only remaining question in this video is how do we calculate those gradients exactly? And that's gonna be the biggest topic in this video. But first, here's the error function. So I've called it capital L for loss. You can just call it error, whatever you wanna call it. But the error function is gonna be very simple in this case. It's going to be one half times p hat minus y, the L2 norm squared. Let's pause for a second and think about why this error uh, function makes any sense. So p hat is collecting all of these pi hats. So like I said before, we have these n training examples 
if we run each of them through the neural network, whatever the weights and biases might be at the moment, we're going to get some kind of predicted probability for each of these examples. What our hope is, is that for examples where the y, which is the true response, is actually zero, we would hope that the predicted probability is also close to zero, because that would give us a good match between the prediction and the truth. Conversely, for examples where the predicted probability is high, we're hoping those match up to cases where y is actually equal to one. And so that's why taking this difference and taking the L2 norm squared of that is actually gonna give us a really good metric for whether or not we're doing good doing well for the current w's and b's that we have set. So to expand this guy a little bit, this is equal to the sum from i equals 1 to n, so across all of the training points, of p hat i minus y i squared, and we put a 1 half in front of that just so the derivative is a little bit easier, uh, as we'll see. So this is the form we're looking at, and we're going to call each of these inner terms l sub i. So it's pretty simple, the error term is basically just the sum of these n error terms L sub i. And so what we want, again, uh, I'm going to be maybe too clear in this video or, or attempt to explain things too explicitly because I think backpropagation can be difficult to understand. What we want to ask is for each of these nine biases and w's, so each of these coefficients which we're not exactly sure what to set, we're going to ask about if we were to change one of these terms a little bit, so if we were to increase or decrease it by a little bit, what effect does that have? on this error. We ask that question for each of these nine terms, and then using the technique of gradient descent, once we have all nine answers, we travel in the direction where this function, the error, is going down, is decreasing the fastest. Because that's going to give us the most efficient path to get to lower and lower and lower errors. And so the most difficult part of that process is typically computing all nine of these gradients. So explicitly what we want is the partial derivative of this guy with respect to each of these nine gradients. That is, if I change each of these independently, keeping all the others fixed, what effect does that have on my error function? Now you might think that the way to compute this, the most natural way, would be start with these terms. So start with these six coefficients because that's the first thing the neural network does, and then worry about these three after that. Totally makes sense, totally natural. But as we'll see, and as the name backpropagation implies, we're actually going to get a much more efficient technique if we work backwards. That is, starting at the final output of the neural network, which is pi hat, we first compute the weights and biases, so these three guys, who are closest to the final output. The reason we do that, as we'll see, is because if we do that first, then we ask the same question about the weights and biases one layer back we can actually use the answers we computed in this layer to help answer the same question about the gradient for previous layers, and so on, and so on, and so on. So in a sense, what we're doing is we're taking the gradients we compute in one layer and propagating them backwards in order to help us calculate the gradient of the layer that came before. Then we propagate those backwards, and so on, and so on, and so on. So let's look at that process now, and I'll try to be very clear in this video about exactly what everything means. So for example, let's say we want to calculate the partial derivative of the error function. So this L is the same thing here with respect to W12. Now, where is W12 in the context of all this? W12 is this arrow right here. I've kind of highlighted that piece with this mini diagram here. So W12 is a weight who begins at H1. So it starts at H1, runs it through an activation function, and eventually ends up at PI hat. So the input, the from node is H1. And the two node is pi hat, which is here. So this from and to intuition will be very important, as we'll see. So again, we want to calculate the partial derivative of this error function with respect to w12. As we saw before, this is simply the sum of these i l's. So we can just do the sum of the derivatives of uh, partial l sub i with respect to w12. Not a big deal. So all that we really have to do now is calculate each of these individual terms. So we're asking for what's the partial derivative of L sub i with respect to W12. Now here's the most important part of the video to understand. So let me get out of the way here. We're going to be using a rule in calculus that you've probably heard of called the chain rule. So the chain rule, uh, even though I won't explain it fully here, in a nutshell it's saying that we can calculate the effect of changing something on changing something downstream by multiplying together each gradient along the way. And I think that's best explained visually before we look at it mathematically. 
So we're asking about what is the effect of changing this weight, which is kind of expressed by this horizontal arrow here. That weight is also in our equations right here. So let me actually just kind of underline it. So we're asking about what's the effect of changing that weight on the final error function. But as we can see from the equations, the first thing that's getting changed is actually z2. So explicitly changing this weight by a little bit is going to change z2 by a little bit. Then changing that z2 a little bit is going to change pi hat by a little bit. Then changing pi hat by a little bit is going to change li. So even though a little change in that weight eventually gets propagated over to the L sub i that we care about, it's not a direct process. There's a couple of steps along the way. And as you go further and further back in the neural network, there's going to be more and more steps along the way. But the chain rule allows us to say that we can multiply all of these little changes together to get the overall change that we're looking for, which is the change of this guy affecting the L sub i. So let's look at the chain rule expressed mathematically. As we said, the first thing is that W12 changes Z2. That's what's happening right here. Then that change in Z2 will change P sub I a little bit. That's what's happening right there. And finally, that change in P sub I is going to affect L sub I. That's the uh, equation you're looking at right here. So even though it might seem daunting at first, all we need to do right now is worry about each of these individual pieces one by one. So let's do that. What is the derivative of Z2 with respect to W12? So that's coming from this equation here. Good news, this is just a linear equation, probably the easiest derivative we could have hoped for. And so it's just going to be the coefficient right here, which is h1. That's why you see h1 right here. Next, what's the derivative of pi hat with respect to z2? So that's this function here. And the little equation we looked at down here says that that's simply going to be pi hat times 1 minus pi hat. So that's just mapping this guy to here. And finally, what's the derivative of l sub i with respect to pi hat? So that's simply just going to be taking the derivative of this term right here with respect to pi hat. That's going to be pi hat minus yi. So we have this entire formula here. And just as a shorthand, let's call this thing that I've bracketed here. So this pi hat, 1 minus pi hat times pi hat minus yi. Collect all that into just one thing called delta pi hat. And so we get that the answer here, so the derivative of L sub i with respect to w12, is simply just h1 times delta pi hat. So that's all good, we have the answer now. Now let's work our way one layer back. So let's pretend that now we want to calculate the derivative of L sub i with respect to w211. Now let's make sure we understand exactly where that is. So this mini diagram says that that is a weight which helps us go from x2 to h1. So specifically here, x2 to h1. We're looking at this diagonal right here. And so we can do the exact same thing. We can write out the chain rule. It's just that in this case, it has many more terms, but we can work through them logically just the same. So now work through it here with me. If we change W211, what's the first thing that's going to change? So in our equations, W211 is going to change Z11. Okay, that's what you see here. Next, changing Z11 is going to change H1. It's exactly what you see next. Then changing H1, is going to change z2. That's the next term you see here. Changing z2 is going to change pi hat. That's the next thing you see here. And finally, changing pi hat is going to change L sub i. And that's exactly what you see here. So we have a multiplication of five terms, which can look confusing, but it's not confusing if you keep in mind that this is really just telling a story. It's saying that changing this guy in the denominator changes this thing, which in turn changes this thing, which changes this thing, all the way until we finally change the thing that's in the numerator of our original partial derivative. And the good news is that each of these individual guys is pretty easy to compute, and more so we can see a pattern now. So let's compute this guy. So what is the derivative of z11 with respect to w211? That's simply just going to be x2, because it's linear. So we get x2 here, then what's the derivative of h1 with respect to z11? h1 with respect to z11, that's just going to be a sigmoid derivative, so that's just going to be h1 times 1 minus h1. And we can just keep going. So these derivatives are not too difficult. You can just map these equations to the proper derivatives, and you see you have this long-looking term here. But now we see where backpropagation starts to come in, because some of this stuff we've already computed. Notice that we call this guy in brackets here simply delta pi hat which means we've computed this in the past. Since we're propagating backwards and we're storing these partial answers along the way, we have this number stored somewhere. 
And you see that that's exactly what's showing up in these last two terms here. So we can simply just say that this is delta pi hat. So that already simplifies the equations a little bit. Now let's create a new delta term. So let's say that w12 delta pi hat, so this thing in brackets here, we're going to give that the shorthand name as delta h1. And beyond just mathematically defining something as a new delta, I want us to intuitively think about why is this term important? What is w12? Where is it in the diagram? w12 is this horizontal arrow right here. And the current weight we're looking at is this diagonal arrow here. And so the reason that we have a w12 coming out here is because it's saying that in the two node, h1, so notice that h1 is the two node for this partial derivative we're looking at currently. In order for us to get from the two node to the final answer, the arrow that we have to use is w12. And that's why you see a w12 times delta pi hat here. So it's really helpful in this back propagation math instead of just looking at it mathematically, which can drive you insane. Trust me, I've tried to do this purely mathematically. I think if you look at it visually, like draw this picture for yourself, think about it in terms of changes getting propagated from one layer to the next, basically moving from one arrow to the next to the next, that can be really helpful in matching the mathematics up to the actual thing that's going on in the neural network. So we call this delta H1. And now I'm ready to show you the pattern here. And then we'll see another example of how that pattern comes up to further convince yourself. But we have this final term here. So we have x2 times h1, 1 minus h1, delta h1. That's the answer to what's the partial derivative of L sub i with respect to w211. But let's try to derive a pattern out of it. So this first one, x2, is the value of the from node. The from node right here. And by from node, again, I mean that the node that's at the left-hand side, or the sending side, if that helps you, of the current weight that we care about. Then we have h1 times 1 minus h1, which is the two nodes value times 1 minus the two nodes value. Two node being the node that's on the right-hand side, or the receiving side of this weight we're looking at right now. And then finally we have delta two node. So let's prove that this pattern is true by looking at just one more partial derivative so we can start getting the hang of things here. Let's compute the partial derivative of L sub i with respect to w1, 2, 1. And this mini diagram says that the from node here is x1 and the two node is h2. Now I won't go through in the same level of detail, but we find that in the end our answer is x1, h2, 1 minus h2 times delta h2. Does that follow the pattern? from node, yep, two node times one minus two node, yep, and delta two node, yep. So we see that even though the backpropagation math can seem confusing, there is this pattern going on. And specifically the pattern arises because we are propagating these derivatives backward, which means that we can use the changes we get at some layer and cache those results, put them somewhere to get easily later, and use those when we're asking about what's the derivative of the loss or the error going one layer backwards. And that way we are propagating these gradients, these derivatives backwards and backwards. So this whole process becomes much more efficient and easier to understand. And again, in the context of actually solving for these weights, this is important because what you're gonna do is again, randomly initialize all these nine weights, calculate all of these partial derivatives using this back propagation technique. Then you're gonna move in the direction of steepest descent. So you're gonna use gradient descent to move in the direction which is causing your loss function or your error function to go down the fastest. And so that's going to involve updating all of these weights based on their uh, respective gradients. Then you just calculate the gradients again and you keep going until some stopping condition is met. And that's how you get the right, the correct, best weights in a neural network. Okay, so hopefully you understood backpropagation a little bit better uh, than you did before. If you did, please like and subscribe for more videos just like this. And I'll see you next time.